Oh, okay. I've hit record. Welcome, Dan Atrell, my good pal from the University of Waterloo, uh, who has recently defended his dissertation. Um, so uh, welcome to the Esoteric Beat, uh, gentle listeners. Um, this is a show that I haven't done for quite a while, so I'm just going to talk for a moment about like what the purpose of the show is. Um, I like to report on the esoteric studies scene. Uh, I'm doing this, um, you know, slightly as, as like an outsider artist because I'm not exactly, um, you know, a tenured academic or anything. And uh, I like talking to both um, scholars and practitioners, uh, especially when talking about, um, you know, what we sometimes refer to the, the broom closet, right, where uh, there's this weird sort of um, uh, boundary problem between, you know, who is actually, uh, you know, where does this knowledge come from that we are, are wielding in esoteric studies. And so uh, I've invited Dan to come talk about the Societas Magica conference that I attended recently, and, and Dan was at in a virtual way, uh, which had the theme of undiscipline. Uh, so we were talking about at this conference kind of all of the, the, the disciplinary boundaries that, that create problems for us as we're trying to um, make esoteric studies a more um, serious, uh, um, what do you call it, a, a more serious um, academic discipline, I guess. <laughs> yeah, academic discipline, academic topic, right? And um, you know, what is it that we need to do to, to sort of like change the field or grow the field or, or uh, build the field? Um, so my guest, Dan Atrell, let me say, I said you recently defended your PhD. You want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, sure. So my PhD was on um, the Latin polemical tradition and its reception in the Renaissance, particularly with Pico della Mirandola and Marsilio Ficino, who, you know, Ted, you are no stranger to these characters. And um, it it went well. Uh, it was well received, and um, yeah, my my basic premise was that uh, we look at Ficino and we look at Pico and gentlemen like this, and we often overemphasize some of their elements as maybe Renaissance magi, uh, and often that comes at the expense of their uh, of the emphasis on the fact that these were religious polemicists. And so um, my, my job was sort of to realign the focus a little bit toward this. And it's not to say that they are only one thing or another, but to say that scholarship tends to emphasize one aspect or another. So with Ficino in particular, we often look at him as Ficino the humanist or Ficino uh, the translator of, as translator of Plato, or Ficino, the Magus, when we look at the three books on life. But uh, I spent a lot of time working with a translation team translating Ficino's anti-Jewish uh, anti and anti-Islamic pro-Christian polemics. And this really um, gives a different vision of, of Ficino, one of Ficino the priest and one of uh, Ficino the polemicist. And so we see uh, how... Uh, identity was constructed in the Renaissance through these polemics and how it wasn't simply just, I believe what I believe, you believe what you believe. It was really people would square off against each other and challenge one another's beliefs and say, ah, but did you consider this uh, part of the Talmud or this part of, of um, the Quran? And a large part of Christian um, polemics is involved with beating the enemy at his own game. And I suppose that is a polemical tactic that is not just a Christian thing. It goes back to antiquity as well. But we see it as particularly prominent in the use of things like Kabbalah or the use of things uh, like, like um, Platonism, where that is a pagan belief system ultimately, but for someone like Ficino or Pico, it was used to bolster uh, their belief in Christianity. And so that's really what a lot of my dissertation work focused on. And it took me into all kinds of avenues in um, the study of Kabbalah and the study of Neoplatonism. And, uh, and it was a it was a very interesting thing. I'm glad to be done because now I get to look at other things or get to work on other things. I'm hitting up the job market and see seeing what I can try to teach. Um, I have my eyes set on some some classes that are like mythology and 
uh, Latin language and things like that. So I would really love to, to teach in those areas. So hopefully that pans out for me. Great. Um, and, you know, this dovetails a lot with my work, which you can hear in an interview that uh, I did on Dan's show, uh, where I talked a lot about how I was trying to do a similar project, um, contextualizing uh, Pico della Mirandola's magic in terms of the work uh, uh, or uh, the, his interest in pseudo Dionysius, right? And how he and people like Roiklin interpreted Kabbalah as a sort of symbolic theology along the lines mm -hmm. of what um, the mystical theology was doing, right? So they interpreted Jewish mysticism as a sort of mystical theology and, uh, you know, in order, it's like you want to do magic studies, right? You want to do esoteric studies of these guys, but, um, you know, the way you get your foot in the door in the ac academic world, and I think anybody who wants to follow in the footsteps of, of Dr. Attrell, you know, you got to get your chops doing these eye-burning projects, and we thank you for your eye-burning labors uh, reading this horrible book <laughs> of, uh, of Ficino on the Christian religion, um, and, uh, you know, you got to get your chops, right? Like, what are you going to teach? Um, are you going to teach, you know, Latin classes? Are you going to get really good at Latin, right? All that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, one of the reasons it was hard for me to get into academia is I struggled with the languages. So I'm always really impressed with, uh, you know, these efforts. And there's so many texts out there that need um, translating. So if you were to like, you know, uh, real quick before we move on to the conference, if you had a grad student who you could just like throw at some Renaissance magic text that needs translating, what have you come across recently that you're like, I can't believe this isn't available? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, in terms of magic, it's difficult. I, I think if there are people working on it, but something like um, Berengaris Ganelius is, um, what is it, the Summa Magicae. Mm. And I think, I think, is it Brian Johnson has done? A, oh, I think he's done a chapter of, or not a chapter, but a section of it on cool. uh, planetary. Um, oh, now I'm forgetting. But this text is very important and has very little work done on it. Um, now, in, in terms of that's magic, in terms of Kabbalah, there is so much Kabbalah um, done in Latin. And the problem is, people often would ask themselves, I think, what is the worth of this? Mm -hmm. You know, why would I go and look at Paolo Rizzius's translation of, um, of Gekatila's translation of the Gates of Light, the, the Sha'are Ora? I, I, you know, I can't answer that for people because it depends on what their interest is. Some people are interested in inception and some people are interested in uh, reception. And a lot of work that I do is on reception, which is important historiographically and from a scholarly point of view. But a lot of people who, let's say, are practitioners, um, they might not have as much interest in that. So it's it's difficult to to say to somebody what they might be interested in um, when really the what I'm looking at is a lot of stuff that has to do with reception. And uh, that often turns a lot of people off. <laughs> I know that for Picatrix, that turns some people off. So I worked on the Latin Picatrix and our our interest was in the European reception of the text in Latin. And a lot of people were wondering, well, why wouldn't why don't you work on the Arabic text? That's the original text. And it's like, well, that's the difference between somebody who is trying to get a perfect vision of the magic system itself from the original text versus somebody who is trying to trace out the history of the reception of a thing. Um, so they're very different areas of study. And I, I think that reception studies is is really a rich area for um texts that have been not touched and you know, i have a pdf folder full of texts that have not been touched but whether you could get somebody interested in them is another thing brian johnson by the way friend of the show uh you can see my interview uh with him uh about his uh necromantic manual uh uh, edition that came out recently. That was a fun interview. Um, highly recommend his work. And another great example of somebody who's just scrapping and doing a bunch of great work in, in magic studies and publishing. Um, uh, so, you know, one thought uh, that I had before we move on um, to the conference, uh, 
thinking about these translations, I recently saw your show with Dr. Justin Sledge on uh, Esoterica, which is another highly recommended um, friend of the show program. And uh, you talked about Roy Klin's wonder working word, right? De verbo merifico. And that hasn't even seen translation. No, nope, I think that, about that's like ground zero for something that needs to be done which would be of great interest to practitioners. It's, it's very accessible. You know, you could read that text and get something out of it, whereas slogging through, you know, Ficino's, um, you know, platonic theology is going to take, you know, for you to understand what you're doing with it. It didn't take a whole lot of, you know, kind of prepping, right? Uh, but, you know, you can just go read that Charles Zika article on uh, the Wonder Working Word and get a whole lot out of it if you're just uh, like an interested reader, right? And I feel mm -hmm. like that's a, you know, a text is just scandalous that, you um, you know, I think about how when I started in 2004, my MA, um, it was really hard to do esoteric studies, but so much stuff has come out since then. And so as a kind of popularist, you know, I can I can just talk about all the great material that's out there now and get a bunch of grist for the mill. Um, so, you know, we've only got the 40 minute Zoom meeting, right? Let's go ahead and move on to uh, the conference. So Societus Magica, I've got it called up here. So I'm just going to uh, look at my aha program. So Magic Undisciplined happened. Uh, it was a Societus Magica International Conference, University of South Carolina last September. And uh, it was convened by Matthew Melvin Kushke and Marla Segal. Now, um, in terms of our esoteric beat uh, interest, um, we're very excited about this breaking news that I have to report for you all. Um, so Matthew has pulled off an absolute coup. And I'm going to just ask you, Dan, can you evaluate that? Would you agree with that statement? Yeah. I mean, in collaboration with Noah. So with they've, Noah, they've yeah. really uh, and uh, a team effort, I think. Noah Gardner, who is a great pal, emailed me out of the blue to let me know about this conference, right? And he's like, hey, Dad, I haven't heard from you a while. Uh, you know, we're doing this conference. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I, I just dropped everything and, and took the first five days off of my new job to go fly out to South Carolina to, you know, party with my pals. And uh, we had an amazing time. Um, so Matthew and Noah have somehow created the first fully funded master's degree in, um, gosh, is it the first fully funded master's degree in esoteric studies at all in North America? Like it's a magic and occult science theme for graduate studies, right? So you can go do an MA in magic at the University of South Carolina and um, it's fully funded, meaning, you know, they, they pay you. Uh, so let me read uh, Matthew's tweet here. Period and region of specialization are wide open and disciplinary fields include history of science, history of religion, global history, and Southern history, any of which may be combined. Islamists, Europeanists, and South Asianists are particularly um, encouraged to apply. And they have some uh, impressive scholars on their team who know a lot about uh, South Asian studies and history. Um, so let's see, the fully funding includes stipend, tuition abatement, and teaching experience guaranteed. Uh, the GRE is not required and application fee waivers are available. So I encourage any of my listeners who are interested in, uh, you know, getting serious um, to apply. So and I'm just going to open it up to you, Dan. So you want to talk about the significance of this for our field. Yeah, I mean, this is huge because I, it's one thing to have a program, but it's another to have a program with funding, right? Because this makes it possible for anybody who has the talent to get in there and do it, whereas most programs traditionally are unfunded, especially at the MA level. Uh, and so the ability to uh, get in there and get, get funded for a two full years it's probably going to be a lot of work that you can get done in that time. Um, I believe that the funding is provided through a TA ship. I mean, there's probably external funding that they've secured, but so you get teaching experience, which is amazing. And then you get access to all of these faculty members like Matt and Noah um, and others. I didn't see the list, but uh, it's a real interdisciplinary intercultural approach to the subject and i think that that is for the first kind of program like this of its kind in north america that's amazing that it's not just you know uh, a warburg type thing where you're just studying european art or culture you could technically i think be 
doing any subject uh, on magic and esotericism from anywhere in the world, whether that be Islamic or African or, uh, you know, North, North or South American. Um, there are lots of opportunities there for people to apply and and expand that field. So I think this is huge. Yeah, I wonder if we should contrast, you know, Matthew's approach with that of um, the folks over in Europe in uh, Amsterdam and at, at the SWE folks and, and everything, you know, because um, and, and also, you know, contrast his approach with sort of the old guard in history of science, um, the way that he's sort of like shaking things up uh, in terms of, um, you know, the the colonialism behind the reason why islamic occult sciences are not taken seriously you know and so um you know they're, they're really like on the cutting edge of um the history of science not just uh magic studies right but uh but the reason why this is really important to um history of science that's why i'm you know showing off my cool alchemy t-shirt for example oh nice um so uh so the conference was a great party and uh you had to zoom in how much of it were you able to catch and do you want to talk a little bit about zoom conferencing in general um so i caught most of it i i didn't catch all of it of course and there was no way for me to catch the parties and the drinking and all of that kind the of drinking stuff, is but... very important you'd be surprised yeah oh and i feel like that is the essence of a conference is everybody shows up to um present papers and give ideas but the real conferencing happens after hours um it's all about the face-to-face -face interaction letting your guard down and and just exchanging ideas and making friendships with professionals that you would uh you wouldn't otherwise or in a in a more formalized context you, you wouldn't get to forge those relationships as tightly. So I think that those conferences are extremely important. Um, One of the, but, you know, I'll, I'll just jump in real quick. One of the fun things that happened that was unexpected, and I got to witness some like amazing career counseling going on, is there was, you know, there was somebody who's like an established academic at a history of science job, right, who does a tarot reading with me. And, uh, you know, Matthew's kind of hanging out, right? And listening to like what we talk about as we do our tarot reading, you know, and then he jumps in and says, well, you know, here's how it's relevant to your career, you, you know? And so, um, and then the same thing happened uh, with another young scholar who I was given a tarot reading to who was telling me about, you know, their anxieties about their, you know, career path. And, and Noah just jumps in and says all this amazing kind of affirming stuff. Right. And uh, I remember when I was, you know, at the Kalamazoo conference, right, it meant so much to me that you just kind of like came and sat down next to me. Hey, Ted, I know you from the Internet. Right. And uh, <laughs> took me under your wing, you know, kind of introduced me <laughs> to some cool folks, including Matthew. Right. And uh, as a result, I made it to that conference. They even gave me money to travel. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. So um, I've got just like a couple of notes about some cool stuff. And I just want to mention real quick, you know, a couple of the cool things that I really liked. Uh, Dan Harms talked about um, information structures for scholars, right? Like Dan was talking about um, how, uh, you know, how is it that we're like interfacing with the public as scholars? How is it that we're kind of like archiving this material? There was some sort of like library science angle to it. Were you were you uh, there for that? Can you give me any? Kind I don't of I don't think so. But it was really interesting. And I was thinking about your work, especially. And I think you might have referenced your work, you know, in terms of the, the modern hermeticist stuff that you do on YouTube, where you're kind of like reaching out to the public, popularizing these ideas, um, creating stuff. I think about how Dr. Justin Sludge is doing such good work in this regard. I want to get you, you both on my show to do a panel about this. Um, doing esoteric studies, um, combating all the sort of misinformation that's out there, right? And um, you know, putting it out there in a scholarly way, but that's accessible um, to the public. So I thought that it was really cool that we got to talk about that um, at a conference. And, you know, in terms of my interest as the esoteric beat, I thought that that was a big deal. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how your project is going on YouTube? Yeah, it's going really well. I mean, right now, my goal is to try to put out as many primary sources that I can for people, because there's so much content on the internet that is people talking about stuff. And while that's fine, there's not a lot of content that is the stuff itself. And so what I've been trying to do is um, get people refocused 
uh, on the sources to return to the sources and to try to get people to look at those things. Often I have to work with uh, public domain stuff. So it's usually outdated in the grand scheme of things because it's pe people writing things either 100 years ago or even 200 years ago, um, sometimes even 500 years ago, if I'm lucky. And uh, I really enjoy doing that kind of work more so than just summarizing or making little little brief comments about a thing. I think it's you can get people much more in depth uh, and interested when you just present the source itself. And I have great respect for people who do that. And I did do a lot of that for a while, but I found that I was kind of burning out or stretching myself thin where you end up talking too much about things that you don't necessarily know all that well, because we can only know so much. Um, so in that sense, I've been trying to stick to the sources and get people uh, interested and engaged in that way. But lately, I've been doing a lot of appearances like this one on uh, Esoterica with Justin Sledge. I know you and him go way, way back. Um, and uh, lately, I just had uh, Dr. Zvitsa on, who is doing the archaeology of ancient magic and ritual practice project. And so she just, I think she reached her goal for her Kickstarter project. And her whole project is about cataloging magical signs and symbols in a kind of like really exhaustive, like Lynn Thorndike style um, scientific compilation of all of the magic signs. And I think when we look at that kind of work, we'll have data that we can look at these signs and see if they exist across multiple texts and you know what are the contexts for these signs are they used uh if the if if a certain sigil has been used four or five times across uh four or five different texts in a two or three hundred year period we can look at the context that those uh signs and sigils are taken from and um get more information about it because they're they're very little known and little studied so i was very happy to be a part of that project in a way to shed some light on her work and that's kind of what i'm trying to do is use use my platform and my voice to bootstrap people like this who are doing really good work um both both to uh get people to reflect on the sources and to get people interested in esotericism and magic from a, a scholarly point of view. Um, not to say, you know, that people who were not doing that before, um, but that there's, I'm just one more voice in the wilderness trying to do it that way. Now there's a uh, crowdfunding for that project, right? You can like sponsor a magical gem or something cool yes. like that. So that's, that's the project, the Kickstarter that she just reached her goal um in order to make that work public because otherwise it would have had to be behind a paywall and nobody would have access to it or maybe like 10 people would have access to it and this way now that it's fully funded people can actually access it anybody can practicing magicians scholars scholar practicing magician combos um of which you know there are many many so that's great. I'm I'm really happy that that turned out. Um, and then other than that, uh, I also uh, participated in the Astro Magia conference, uh, which was excellent. Um, I didn't really know what to expect of it. And it was it was very rigorous. Everybody was extremely delightful. And it was uh, it was great to be able to talk about Picatrix in detail without actually having to introduce the text or talk about what it is or anything like that. I could just jump right into the details and everybody there knew everything about it, right? So that was awesome. Um, I, like, I'm sure there are people there who, who know the text better than I do. And um, that was a, a real uh, pleasure for me to be able to talk nerd out with people who are on the same level. So I was I was really excited about that. That reminds me, you know, at uh, at Matthew's conference, we had um, uh, Jerry, I forget his name, uh, who was like a badass Roger Bacon scholar. 
um, who happens to be at the University of South Carolina with these guys, right? So like, that's another thing about that opportunity, the MA opportunity, you know, they have an expert in Roger friggin' Bacon, who is yeah. like one of the most important med- medieval philosophers to touch on magic along with Albertus Magnus, you know, and uh, I-, I asked him a question about, um, and it was so cool to be able to tap this guy, you know, he mentioned something about how Roger Bacon is sort of in between Magnus and Aquinas in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, something or other, right? And uh, like, how is he situated in terms of these, you know, these debates about magic, the way that they think about magic, right? Whereas magic, is magic okay, right? Like mm-hmm. <laughs> that kind of stuff. And so um, uh, we got about 10 minutes left. Um, do you want to talk about anything you learned at this conference? Any any takeaways or like exciting papers that you saw? Hmm. Well, I mean, I, I saw a few papers. The first one that I saw, and I, I feel terrible because I don't remember the name of the presenter, but she presented on the Egyptian deckhands. And I believe mm. she was an Egyptologist. So that was excellent. And it was nice to see the you know, the colliding of the academic side with the practitioner side. But sometimes you could see that tension rising when people would ask like, hey, what's your favorite deckhand? And she would be like, well, I'm not really a practitioner, so I can't really answer that question. Like I could say which one I think is the coolest or whatever, but uh, but I don't really know which which one is my favorite, so to speak, in terms of using it for practical magic or decanic rituals or things like that. Uh, Christopher Warnock gave a talk, which was was very good. Um, so for those who don't know, Christopher Warnock is also a translator of the Picatrix, and he's kind of the like grandfather of the astro magical revival. Um, he, you know, he was he's been doing it for a long time, practicing astro magic from a from a reconstructionist point of view, and he basically um, I don't know who he was speaking too theoretically but i imagine there are people out there who say like oh your way of doing things is wrong and what his thesis was essentially was now i don't want he he was like i'm not gonna let people say that i'm doing it wrong they might be doing it differently but here's the way i do it and he had his own definitions of magic and um for example i think it was something along the lines of doing um astro or doing magic with astrological spirits and that's that's a good definition as any i i feel bad because i'm not uh, representing his ideas as clearly as as he would but he he definitely had made a lot of great points um and it was nice to see this kind of balance in the uh the cast of people speaking between people who study astrological magic uh, as a historical phenomenon, and then the people who are really have the hands on stuff, because, you know, they're looking at different things, and they have different strengths and weaknesses. And I think that being able to bring those people together in a giant digital room, many digital rooms, actually, uh, there were multiple talks going on at the same time, and they were all filmed. So people could go back and watch them. Um, uh, I was really impressed. One guy, again, I feel bad because I don't remember all the names, um, was a practitioner of astral magic who was working with Ficino's three books on life. And he did awesome stuff. Like he actually like did a bird sacrifice and ate the, uh, he, he ate a pigeon's liver Picatrix style in wow. his own words and had pictures and all that. And um, yeah, so lots of interesting people who are taking these texts and and putting them into practice. And, you know, that there's no better way to learn than doing that. Yeah, um, that that is, you know, putting a finger on the pulse of one of the main concerns of my show. And it reminds me of a question that I asked Claire Fanger at the conference during our, uh, I think it was during the like wrap up period, right? And, uh, you know, I kind of like thanked everybody who like, you know, three or four people kind of had pieces of this puzzle where I've been perplexed about this problem since the beginning of my graduate career. And, you know, I was able to kind of formulate my question a little bit better, which was, you know, Claire was talking about her guy, um, the the visionary um, medieval magician who uh, who did the Ars Notoria kind of work. Is What's his name? Uh, John Yeah. Yeah. 
And, uh, you know, I, I asked her like, so this guy, you know, he was like looking at these texts and having a vision uh, with his body. He was looking at these images and having a vision like with his body, like shouldn't scholars be looking at these texts and having visions using their bodies in order to kind of like understand, you know, like when a practitioner comes to these texts, they're going to have certain needs. Right. And I think that scholars should like understand like what you discover you need when you're trying to put the, the, the stuff into practice. Right. And one of my pals, my new pals from the conference, who's a historian of science, was very anxious about their practice as an astrologer. Right. They're like, well, I can't go public about this because I'll, I'll lose my job. Well, maybe I won't lose my job, but I won't get a letter of recommendation if it comes out that this serious historian of science, you know, who works on uh, uh, whatever it is uh, that has to do with astrology. I'm not going to you know, name names or anything. Um, you know, maybe they're not going to get their letters of recommendation. Maybe they're not going to be seen as serious. Right. But from my point of view and in terms of the values of the show, uh, the esoteric beat. Right. I highly value somebody who's willing to kind of like look past that like weird block that we have, that weird kind of discomfort with putting this stuff into practice. You know, yeah. uh, so when we were at Kalamazoo, I asked Joseph Peterson and this this is a, something I thought about when we were talking about the. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce her name. Dezuiza, uh project. Oh, it's Fitza. Fitza. Okay, and uh, the the project um, with the the ancient magical characters, right? And I asked Joseph Peterson, like, you know that Goetia of Doctor Rudd book that like Alistair Crowley and Matt Mar- uh, and Mathers made into a uh, uh, the the Goetia that that the Golden Dawn people use, right? But it goes back to this like 16th century text, the Goetia of Doctor Rudd. There's all of these nifty. Um, you know, sigils of these goetic demons, right, that you invoke. And, you know, when I was a kid, like in a bit of a psychonaut and doing a lot of meditation and visionary experience, I would look at those things and be like, oh, wow, I'm like recognizing things that I see when I'm having like visionary experiences. And like, sometimes they seem like these little anthropomorphic demons, but it's like constructed using familiar shapes of characters that go way back that remind me of you know the the sigils on magic squares Mm -hmm. right and so i asked uh, dr peterson you know like where where does this come from and we don't really know right you know it obviously goes back to the the characters and the the pgm and you know all that but like how how does it evolve into this obviously there was some kind of system some kind of formal system for sort of like programming how we make a goetic image like there's so much that we don't know that's like obviously there's some technique there right obviously there's something something going on yeah and and what's weird like i asked uh dr Zvitza on this recent podcast that we did together you know how do we how did we get from hieroglyphs for example to the magical symbols in the PGM when in the demotic, you know, in our entire extant corpus of demotic sources, there are none. So it's like they were invented at some point or taken from somewhere, but we don't know where. And so that's the kind of stuff that we need. We need archaeologists and we need um, really hard nosed scholars and historians to look to where the origins of these things are, because people will postulate one origin or another, but nobody actually has the documents or the papyri where they can just show you and say, ah, here is the missing link, right? Um, The trajectory of the evolution is not so clear. So I think that it's really important to have a foot in both, especially astrology and stuff like that. Like, If you don't know astrology, like what business do you have talking about it you got to know at least some of it whether you you know make predictions on astrology is another thing but not understanding the mechanics or the system um as a springboard to further learning and 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 nobody knows all of it right because it's such such a huge science that is has so much um in it and it is different from one time period and one group of people to another and so I think that this this alliance between practitioners and um, and scholars is very fruitful. And these conferences, I believe, have been doing that. Uh, they've really been bringing people together in a way that was that was never the case before. Because 
the you know the study of magic from a formal academic point of view point of view is very recent it is from the last 20 years or so so that's all the time we got zoom is going to shut us down and that's all the time i want to ask of you my friend uh thank you so much for being here um dan is at modern hermeticist on twitter and uh, also on youtube uh so check them out leave comments and uh, you know there's so much that we've covered that give us reason to be optimistic about esoteric studies join us leave comments on our youtube send us at messages on twitter uh, you know, I'm available for, for counseling at a pay what you can uh, if you're interested in going into this field. Um, you know, and I, I have students who I, I help for free and I have students who can afford to pay. Uh, hit us up. You know, uh, we're happy to interact uh, with the public and we're just so excited 